All right, good morning. Morning, morning online. Say it. You're allowed to say it online. All right, good morning. Good to have you. Um, we have been very conscious about, um, about the, um, not spreading germs, and so everybody who's here, all four of us are spread out with lots of space. Um, but in our family, we're actually teaching everybody, even Oliver, who are, is our youngest, has come up, we've come up with a training video. So if you're not quite sure how to sneeze, let Oliver teach you. Hey. Can you show me how you sneeze? Play. Okay, we'll play. Show me how you sneeze. Achoo. Oh, good job. <laughs> Achoo. Okay, so that's how you, how you do it. So today we're talking about uh, another of these questions that are really appropriate. And in fact, every week we're going to talk something that's really appropriate for what we're going through here. Um, why is it that we even live in a world where there are such things as coronaviruses? Um, it reminds me, there was a story that Somerset Mom, the English writer, once wrote about a janitor who was working at St. Paul's in London. A priest met him one day, discovered that he was illiterate, said, you don't qualify to work here, and fired him. God wasn't sure what he was going to do, and so he went to work for a tobacco shop worked really hard, eventually was able to save enough money that he bought the tobacco shop, worked really hard, he was able to buy another tobacco shop so that over the decades he actually expanded, owned a chain of tobacco shops in London, became one of the wealthiest business people in all of London. So it's like 30 years later, he's talking with his banker and his banker says, you have an amazing life story. I mean, look how well you've done and you can't even read and write. Can you imagine how well you would do if you could read and write? And the guy, you know, where you'd be if you could read and write? He says, I'll tell you where I'd be. I'd be a janitor at St. Paul's. You know, it wasn't as funny that time as it was before. <laughs> something about the fourth time you tell it that just kind of loses something. But the point is, that's how we want all of our stories. If, if, if we can handle suffering, if we know there's a happy ending. We can handle even injustice if we know there's some redemptive element to look forward to. But we don't always know in the middle of it, and so we find ourselves distressed, saying, okay, God, what are we supposed to do with this? And it has created what classically is called the problem of suffering and evil in the world. And philosophers and theologians have wrestled with this for ages in fact, many would argue it is the single most difficult question that we ever have to answer. Um, Epicurus is the one who formulated it as a, the problem as a trilemma. Um, other people have said it in different ways, but it basically goes back to Epicurus, who made the argument, um, if God is good and God is great, then evil wouldn't exist. There would not be suffering and injustice. So, either God is... Um, Either God is good, but he is not powerful, or God is powerful, but he is not good, or God doesn't exist. And wherever you come down on this, the reality is all of us wrestle with this core issue in, this time, in times like this even. It's like, God, why, and often it's not just, it's not philosophical, it's very personal, not just God, why do bad things happen to good people, but God... Why are these things happening to me? How do you deal with that? How do you help somebody else wrestle through that? That's what we're going to talk about today. So you personally can have a strong faith um, if you are not a believer. So you can understand what the Bible would say, but also for us to be able to help other people who are going through this time and are experiencing the wrestling match with this question too. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are present wherever we are. We thank you that your presence is not limited to a single place that we have to go to or a single building, but that you um, can speak to us through your word right now. And so it's my prayer, Lord, wherever we are, wherever people are, are, are listening to your word spoken, that you would encourage and you would strengthen and you would heal that you'd make us your church stronger, more in love with you than ever before. It's through Christ we pray, amen. Now, 
um, many people have looked at this problem of suffering in the world and have come to the conclusion, I just can't believe in God because there's so much evil in the world. In fact, um, I'm convinced, and it's not, I mean, it's not profound with me, but um, many would argue that this is probably the single greatest reason that people lose their faith, that it's not because they've looked at all the facts out there in the universe and have come to the conclusion there isn't a God, it's because they've experienced suffering in their own lives and just don't have a way to harmonize that with a good God. David Hume articulated this centuries ago. Um, Hume, the, one of the leading you know, enlightenment thinkers, wrote, were a stranger to drop suddenly into the world, I would show him a specimen as specimen of its ills, a hospital full of diseases, a prison crowded with malefactors, a field strewn with carcasses, a fleet floundering in the ocean, a nation languishing under tyranny, famine, and pestilence. Honestly, I don't see how you can possibly square this with an ultimate purpose of love. David Hume puts it in terms of purpose and in terms of love. He says, if the world is purposeful and there's a loving um, beginning to it, a loving God, how can you explain the way that it is? That's a reasonable question many have asked. In more recent times, Bart Erdman has become one of the more popular agnostics of our generation. And Erdman has written, it actually was an interview with, um, with NPR one time, they asked him how he lost his faith. He said, the short version is this, I realized I could no longer reconcile the claims of faith with the facts of life. In particular, I could no longer explain how there could be a good and all-powerful God actively involved in this world, given the state of things. For many people who inhabit this planet, life is a cesspool of misery and suffering. I came to the point where I simply could not believe that there is a good and kindly disposed ruler who is in charge of it all. And again, he's asking this honest question, and you can hear Epicurus's trilemma there. If God is good and God is powerful, how can the world be a cesspool of pain and suffering for so many people? And I know that that's where people are now, and not just in terms of the threat of the virus, but losing their jobs and losing their finances, you know, losing their retirement. Lose. It's just like, God, if you really looked out for us, Wouldn't you be providing? Wouldn't you, you wouldn't allow the world to be like this. And I'm really heartened by the fact that the Bible doesn't shy away from these serious questions. The Bible doesn't say, don't ask those questions or people of great faith, don't talk about, talk like that. In fact, um, what is perhaps the oldest book in the Bible, certainly one of the longest books in the Bible certainly one of the longest to read, is the book of Job. The book of Job is a book of suffering. Job was a righteous man, the greatest man in the East, it says, as it introduced him. But suddenly, in one day, everything started to fall apart for Job. He lost his cattle, he lost his homes, he lost his business, he lost his children. He didn't lose his wife. And then a couple of days later, a little bit later, he lost his health, which meant he lost the res- his own dignity. He lost the respect of people around him. And so his wife came to him one day in the middle of this um, great injustice and evil. And she said to him, Job, why don't you curse God and die? She says, Job, why are you holding on to your integrity, this notion that there's a good God who's a caring God? Even if he is, he certainly is not working for you. Job, you might as well just curse God and die. And I love the fact that that's in the Bible because that is just so honest. We feel that way sometimes about God. You can imagine she is probably in a state of shock almost from all that she has lost in just one fell swoop. And, and so in that state, she says, what we feel, goes, Job, curse God and die. Job's response to her is quite strong. She, he says, you speak as a foolish woman speaks. Now, if you understood the Hebrew, the original language and the original culture in which that was stated, that's essentially like Job saying, Uh, 
you are a godless, foolish, stupid woman. Shut up. Now, I, I, I did some research this past week and surveyed about a hundred marriage counselors and asked them if they ever thought, if they thought this is a good way for a husband to respond in the middle of a conversation with his wife when he's frustrated. And with unanimity, they said, um, husbands, Christian husbands, this is not, you may want to quote scripture in your conversations with your wife, but not this scripture. <laughs> You know, curse, you're, a, you're a foolish, godless woman, you know. But again, you can just kind of feel their frustration. This is kind of how some of us have been through the coronavirus. It's like, we don't say stuff that we would normally say because we're so tired and frustrated. Verse 10, should we accept, Job says, should we accept only good from God and not adversity? And throughout all this, Job did not sin by what he said. Later on, Job would be, would say things that he shouldn't say. But at this point, he has maintained his integrity. Job's response here is echoed by uh, the great Christian writer G.K. Chesterton, who who once said, when belief in God becomes difficult, the tendency is to turn away from him. But in heaven's name, to what? When faith gets shaken because of suffering and injustice, there is a temptation to say, God, I'm done with you. I just want to like curse God. Even if you exist, I am, I'm just fed up with you, Lord. But Chesterton asks the great question, so once you've done that, once you turn away from God, where else are you going to turn? See, it's not enough just to say turn away from God. You have to turn to something else that satisfies other questions too. It doesn't seem self-evident that as soon as you turn away from God, immediately other problems arise. For instance, there's the problem, this whole problem of justice and injustice if there is not a God. Um, C.S. Lewis was an atheist who wrestled with that for a long time. And he said part of what ultimately brought him to God was going through this wrestling match. C.S. Lewis said that um, he was once an atheist because the universe seemed so cruel, but then he realized if atheism were true, there would be no grounds for my complaint. There would be no reason for me to expect justice in the first place. He says, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust, but how had I got to that idea of just and unjust? What was I comparing the universe to when I called it unjust? See, he realized he was smuggling in an assumption that you can only have have if there is a good God. Because if there's injustice, there must be justice. And it must come from something that, it, that is ultimately justice. If there is evil, there must be good. But what is the source of evil? What is the source of good if there's not a good God? He said, of course, I could have given up this idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on me saying that the world, on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it happened not to please me. Atheism, he writes, turns out to be too simple, too simplistic. See, for there to be injustice, in, in, in justice, there has to be a, a God. And so h- how do you deal with that? How do you come up with good or evil? And so atheists, when they're really honest, would say they don't believe there is good or evil. There's just personal preference. I'm reminded of a date that took place, a debate that took place with Bernard, Ber, uh, Bertrand Russell, who was perhaps the last century's leading atheist, at least for most of the century. He was debating a man by the name of Cobblestone, who came to this point and he asked Russell, do you believe there is a, such a thing as good or evil? And Russell said, yes. He said, okay, Mr. Russell, how do you determine between good and evil? He said the same way that I determined between blue and green. Cobblestone said, well, you determine the difference between doing blue and green by seeing. How do you determine the difference between good and evil? And this atheist 
who claim to be an atheist based on naturalism and science and logic said, I determine good and evil based on feeling. Now, many have noted that Cobblestone was a kind man and so did not press it with, with um, Russell. But had he not been so kind, that he should have asked Russell the question, in some cultures, people like to have their neighbors over for dinner. In other cultures, people like to eat their neighbors for dinner each on the basis of feeling, do you have a personal preference? <laughs> um, the, um, it, it kind of, it, it, it illuminates the problem, doesn't it? If, it's, if right and wrong is just based on feeling, then how do you really determine it? And, 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 and it's counterintuitive. Can you really say it isn't evil for the Nazis to kill six million Jews? And as soon as you are willing to say it's evil, you have to say, okay, but how do I determine that which is evil? Again, C.S. Lewis argues that for ethics to be determined, for ethics to be, to come up with ethics, you have to be able to answer three questions. They're all the questions that you would ask of a ship on the sea. The first question is, how do you keep the ship afloat? That's the personal ethics question. The second question is, how do we keep the ship from bumping into other ships? That's the social ethic question. But the third question is the most serious of the three. It is the essential question, and that is, why is the ship on the ocean in the first place? What's its purpose? See, and while, um, while a world without God can answer a pragmatic ethic of, well, it's because it's what's best for me or because it's what's best for us, it cannot answer the most, most important question of life, and that is, why are we here? What is the purpose of life if there is not an ultimate purpose giver? What is the purpose of suffering if there is no ultimate one to give us definition? So we could go on with this. And I know many of you are saying, oh, Brett, please, go on, go on, go on. And some of you are saying, please, stop. Okay, go wake up the person beside you, and, um, and we'll go on. So what does the Bible say about the problem of suffering and evil in the world? The Bible, first of all, I want you to know, the Bible does not say, don't worry about it. The Bible doesn't say you shouldn't ask the questions. In fact, the Bible is filled with people who are frustrated by what's going on. David would write, you know, God, why have you abandoned me? Why do you allow the righteous to suffer? In Psalm 73, he would say, why do you allow wicked, the wicked to prosper? Another time, David would cry out, I, am a, I stay awake. This is Psalm 107, verse 3. I am a, a, like a lonely bird on the roof. Is there any greater suffering, honestly, than loneliness? Um, uh, keep flipping through the Bible, you come to an entire book. Other than Job, yeah, you have the book of Job, oldest and biggest, one of the biggest anyway, that deals with the injustice of the world. But then you come to another book written by a, a man known as the weeping prophet, Jeremiah, and he writes this book, it's called the book of Lamentations. I love that. It's not the book of Joyentations. It's not the book of Don't Worry, Be happy Happyentations. It's an entire book where he is weeping because of the results of war and sin and death. And then you get to the New Testament and Jesus comes into the world and he's known as a man of sorrows. Yes, he's known as the Prince of Peace, but he's also known as the man of sorrows acquainted with suffering. The Bible takes our suffering very seriously. It doesn't diminish it in the least. It gives us some answers to suffering. The one answer would simply be, some people ask the question, well, why is it? If God's a good God, why did he create a world where there's so much grief, suffering, and injustice? And the first biblical answer to that question is he didn't. Look at Genesis chapter one and you see that God created the world good. 
Every day, he created it good, very good. The original word there is the idea of it was good for purpose, good for life, good for relationships, good for love. It was good. It was a good and perfect world. And then you get to the sixth day of creation, and God creates Adam and Eve. And it says God created man in his image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female. He created them, and God looked, and he said it is very good indeed. Love that. So God creates the world very good, very, very, and part of creating it is perfect is that he creates human beings in his image. Now, if we're going to be created in the image of God, that means we must be created with the ability to love because God is a loving God. And to have the ability to love, we must also have freedom. One of the things, I, you know, I need to write a sermon sometimes, again, sometime again about freedom because, um, because we... Um, It's very easy to lose an understanding of just how valuable freedom is to God. That he actually loves us so much to create us with the ability to love and to be free, even though that freedom means the unsafety of ruining everything. That's a whole different sermon by itself. But So he creates them with this world and the ability to choose to love, but to have the ability to choose to love, you have to have the ability to choose to not love. And so one of the pictures that I like to use, it's a, there's weakness in the analogy, but work with me on it. Imagine that when God created the world, he created this, he created us this huge pond, a perfect pond, a beautiful pond, and he told Adam and Eve, love the pond, live in the pond, it is perfect, enjoy the pond, I've given this for your delight, all I ask is that you love me, all I ask is that you obey me. Love me, obey me, that's the same thing. I just want to be in relationship with you. Listen to my voice and follow. Now for them to be able to really do that, there has to obviously be some option not to do that. And so God doesn't give them like a list of things that they can't do. He just gives them one thing. And God creates this bucket and he just says, you see that bucket with stuff in it? All I ask of you is don't dump the bucket in the pond. Because in that day where you dump the bucket in the pond, everything falls apart. You will surely die. And so Adam and Eve are doing really great. Who knows how long? Till one day, Satan comes up to to them and says, hey, look at that bucket. It's attractive, isn't it? Hey, why don't you dump the bucket in the pond? That'll make you like God. I mean, right now you're not really free if you can't do everything. God's just want to restrict your freedom. And now you don't really know everything because if you dump the bucket in the pond, you'll know everything like God knows everything. You'll be like God. The only reason that God doesn't want you to do that is because he doesn't want you to be like him. And Adam and Eve look at the bucket and they lust over the bucket. They think the bucket looks like a really good idea. And so they look at each other and say, hey, let's dump the bucket in the pond. And when they do, they dump all of this poison into the pond. And the pond has been poisoned ever since. You say, but does the whole pond have to be poisoned? Think of it like this. Imagine you have a glass of water. Imagine it is a very large glass of water. And I have coronavirus. And I come to your house and I sip on your cup of water, and I just put a little backwash into your cup of water. How, how much, how diseased is your cup? How many of you are wanting to say, you know, only a little, I'm still glad to drink after Brett, you know, because, no, most of you would say, Brett, I don't want your dirty lips anywhere close to where my, 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 my water has been in good times, let alone now. And so, um, and so you say, no, the whole thing is messed up. And so it is with worlds. Again, to change the analogy. As soon as Adam and Eve opened the window to evil, brokenness and sin and death and disease 
flood in like a tsunami. And ever since then, the world is broken. So one day when you get to heaven and you're answering, the, why is it that there was coronavirus in my generation? Go punch Adam in the nose. It's his fault. Now, having said that, before you get too uppity, we have to step back and also realize, wait a second, to press the analogy, um, God creates all of us and puts a bucket beside all of us in this world. And God gives the same request. He says, all I ask of you is, would you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is why I've given you the Old Testament. He says, the law and the prophets are wrapped up in all the law and the prophets. You can summarize. The purpose of all of them is to help define, to help you understand what it means to love. Because otherwise, you're just hunching. Otherwise, you're just following your feelings. Otherwise, you're just going to follow the culture around you, which may be headed toward destruction. And so, and so just, God says, just love me. That's all I ask. Just don't dump that poison in the, in the pond. But what's the reality? The reality is we all dump poison into the pond. And sometimes I drink the poison that I have dumped in the pond. It's the law of the harvest. We all understand it. You reap what you sow. Um, the New Testament articulates it in, in, in Galatians 6. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. And so before I can get too uppity at Adam and Eve saying, you've messed things up, it's all your fault. Yeah, they did open the door, but when I was given my choice, I made the same choice. You know, the reality is I have cheated. The reality is I have lied. The reality is I have been selfish. The reality is I am proud. The reality is I have lusted. The reality is I have disobeyed my parents. Now, I know you're listening to that list thinking, wow, but I believe the other stuff, but you disobeyed your parents. It shocks me. How could you do such things? But the reality is, we, you get the point. We've all done our share. We all drink our own water, um, and we experience the consequences. It's like you smoke, you get emphysema. You do drugs, you get addicted. You lie, you get caught. You pay the, You see how it works. But that doesn't satisfy everything either, does it? There's another option, you see, and that is sometimes I dump poison into the water and you drink my poisoned water. I sin and you feel the consequences. Ezekiel said the parents, um, the parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So, adults would call this well, theologically, it's called the, 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 the solidarity of sin or sinfulness. Adults call this being a parent. You love your kids, and they break your heart, right? They love their kids. It's like, ah, why don't you obey? Why don't you listen, okay? Kids call the solidarity of, of, uh, solidarity of sinfulness counseling as young adults. You know, it's just like we don't want to hurt each other, but we all pour water into the system and, um, and, we, and we drink somebody else's poison. So, what is the problem? Why is there even the world? The Bible says, the Bible gives us an answer because Adam and Eve did it, because I do it and have my own results or, or consequences or other people sin and we, we drink their poison. Somebody else has, gets drunk, and as a result, we, you know, are in a, they, they were in a car accident as, as a result of their, of their behavior. Now, here's the question. Does that satisfy you? Have an understanding, kind of on an intellectual basis, why evil and sin and the injustice exists in the world, why we experience it, does that satisfy you in the deepest part? No. It can be a satisfaction. I think it's important to understand it intellectually, but there's something inside us saying, I need something deeper. And that is why I heard recently somebody say, the problem of pain and suffering and injustice in the world is not so much a problem as it is a mystery. Problems can be, problems can find answers. Mysteries, the solution has to be discovered. So he said, going to Mars is a problem. Falling in love is a mystery. 
Um, again, go back to G.K. Chesterton. Oops, Chesterton's insight was, one time he said, my problem with life is not that it is rational. My problem with life, he said, is not that it's irrational either. My problem is it is almost rational. The problem can't be solved simply with an answer. It is a mystery that we have to discover. And so God has answers for the mystery, and he answers the mystery in various ways. The first way he would answer is by saying, look at the mystery of my purpose in your life and of what you are made for. The mystery of suffering is that without suffering, we couldn't experience the life that we long for. Without suffering, there is no such thing as the heroic. Um, A way to understand it is um, we have a couple of moms here this morning, and they know what it's like to take their kids when they're infants to the doctor for their shots. And the first time the innocent little one goes and doesn't know what's about to happen and they get the shot and they respond in various ways, some cry. My daughter Emily, I am told, um, did not cry, although I, I, I do remember seeing her get her shots for something at one point. She wouldn't cry, she would just kind of scowl, you know, kind of like, who do you think you are to do that to me and she's going to get back to her. If any of you know my daughter Emily, you know this kind of consistent with her strong personality. But, um, um, but the second time that you take that child, or the third time, you know, that child maybe is thinking about this. Imagine that child having this internal conversation saying, why is mom taking me to this place where, I'll ex- where I will experience more suffering? And your child then reasons through the trilemma And it's like, well, maybe it's because mom doesn't love me. Maybe mom's taking me here to suffer because she doesn't care. Or maybe mom's not powerful. Maybe mom is a is a robot and she's completely, you know, a victim of ontology here, and she just has to do this. Or maybe mom doesn't exist. You know, so it's just there are just three options: either mom's not good, or mom's not great, or mom doesn't exist. You see, the question, the logical question you have to ask is: why do you limit it to a trilemma? Can't it be a quad lemma? Or a five lemma. What's what's five, uh, Scott? What would five be back there? What? You're, I didn't. What's that? Penta, whatever. Yeah, I didn't want the Spanish version of it. I wanted the. We need Greek here, so or Latin, whatever. Anyway, so um, no, what is five? So so for instance, what if you add to that, God is wise. Or there's time to understand. You see, maybe mom is taking the child to get the shot because mom is wiser than the child. And maybe over time, the child will be able to look back and understand the wisdom and the love and the power of mom in that choice. And so it is with our world. the Bible tells us that God allows us to go through suffering because we need it to be the people we desire to be, that we're made to be. The apostle, uh, or I mean, uh, David, the psalmist wrote, when I was afflicted, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, 9 says that God comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our our comfort overflows to you, basically saying. So we're afflicted. If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. How many times have you ever gone through a difficult thing, and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've found encouragement and strength in Christ, and then you've had somebody else um, go through difficult things. We do this all the time in church planting. It's kind of what redeems the pain of church planting, being able to talk to 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds who are now going through it, and they're going through the same stuff we've gone through, and now we're able to say, hey, this is what God taught. This this is how God got us through, and God's going to get you through as well. And so it comforts others as well. One writer wrote down like 20 reasons 
why God allows suffering. It uncovers uh, what's really inside our heart. It breaks our pride. It deepens our desire for God. It breeds humility. It's a warning sign of things that could be potentially worse. It can jumpstart a prayer life. It can deepen our appreciation for scripture. It takes our eyes off of ourselves and our world. It can help us connect with other people. It helps us serve other people. And the list goes on and on and on. I would have you do this experiment. Think about some people in your life that you greatly admire. Think about people from history that you hold up in highest esteem. Think about what they went through. Think about the, 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 the difficulties that forged their character. Think about the struggles that gave them the chance to be heroic. Think about all those details, what the families went through, what their generation went through, and now look back and take away all of their suffering. Take away all of their difficulties. And what have you done? You've taken away their stories. You know, it's, um, what would George Washington be without a Revolutionary War or a Valley Forge? Harriet Tubman without an underground railroad. Frederick Douglass without a, the fight for freedom. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. without the Birmingham jail. Bonhoeffer without Hitler. Um, I'm not saying that those difficulties justify somehow, are, are justified, but I'm just saying God uses those things to make us heroes, to make us the world that we want, and want, want to be. Without difficulties, there are no monuments downtown D.C. There are no heroes because no, no, nobody's doing anything heroic. There's no compassion because there's no need for extraordinary compassion. There's no bravery because there's no danger to have to face and to be brave for. No opportunities to stand against injustice. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross put it like this. She said, the beautiful people, the most beautiful people in the world are those who've known defeat who've known suffering, who've known struggle, who've known loss, who found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people don't just happen. The mystery of suffering is without it, we become nothing. With it, we become the people that we desire, the, the stories that God has made us for. By the way, I would say to parents, this is one reason why we don't do our children any blessing when we're constantly removing the suffering from their lives and trying to make life easy for them so they don't have to, so we protect them from consequences. It's also why um, it's also why this American notion of privilege is so non-biblical. There's no place in the Bible that says I should be upset because some people have more privilege than I do. In fact, just the opposite. The Bible says we rejoice in our lack of privilege. We rejoice in our affliction. We don't envy those somehow who have it easier than we are and get angry at them as though we're missing something. We rejoice because we know that God is with us and in us, giving something superior as a result. Peter says it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. You rejoice in this even though for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, Though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, there's something much more wonderful than privilege, and that is knowing Christ, becoming more like Christ, and that can only come through trials and suffering. The mystery of suffering. 
The second thing about the mystery of suffering that God would give us is not just look at what God is doing around you and in you as a result of the suffering, but the second would be it's the mystery of what he's doing in us for eternal purposes. One philosopher said we ought to understand that this world that we live in, this universe that we live in is actually a very small thing like a womb. He said, now when we were in the womb, we probably imagined that that womb was the whole universe. It was enormous. We may have asked, is there life after birth? You know, is there anything beyond this universe that I'm living in? And then we were born and we found out there is. Could it be that we are to learn something from that pre-birth experience for now, could it be that now we are living in a womb? Although the universe looks big and maybe people ask, is this all there is? And many people actually are convinced this is all there is. Is there life after this womb? The Bible teaches us, yes, it is. Now, when we're in the womb, if we are a, you know, philosophical little nibbler, then we're probably thinking, hey, why am I uncomfortable in here? Hey, why do I have hands? I don't have a video game to play. Why do I have feet? There are no sidewalks to walk on. It doesn't make sense to me why I'm having all this stuff and going through all of this stuff. And then one day, we are born into the next world, and we come into the world, into life, and we realize, oh, all that was developing in me there was pre preparation for me in life that was really life beyond the womb. This is the mystery of suffering the Bible teaches over and over. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, So we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, again, that's the Apostle Paul who was beaten, left for dead, shipwrecked, um, imprisoned, diseased, couldn't see very well. He calls all of this light and momentary. Our light and momentary affliction is preparing for us, preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. When you talk about glory, you're not just talking about heaven in general. You're talking about the character of God. You're talking about God developing his glory, his character in you, forming him, himself in you. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. For what is seen is transient, temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. So we live in a womb as we live in time. But one day, we will be born to eternal life. And in that day, we will understand why God was forming us the way he was through suffering in this life. In a way that we never can in this world. It is why... The most, the people that I have respected most, who've done the most for the kingdom, are also the people who've suffered the most for Christ. They have not been upset for their lack of privilege. They have chosen, actually, to empty themselves of privilege so that they can serve Christ for eternity. I think about Roseanne Russell, who was a mentor of mine, who could have had, a, a, who could have been rich and could have done much with her life, but instead chose to take a blue-collar job so she could serve her church, so she could serve her family, and so she could have the flexibility to teach, to do mess, um, seminars around uh, around the United States whenever asked. Why did she live in such, um, she really had a, quite a meager existence. It's because she was not living for this world. It's because her eyes were fixed on life yet to come. And so it is with us in the mystery of suffering. Annie Johnson Flint, I love her poetry because it grew out of suffering. She was orphaned as a young girl Rheumatoid arthritis twisted and tortured her. She suffered incontinence, developed cancer, was blinded eventually. And yet her book is called The Making of the Beautiful, in which she writes of God. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, multiplies 
peace. His love knows no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we've exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun because His giving continues through this life and into eternity. One day, you and I are going to be delivered from this womb, from the womb of this world. And if Jesus is our Savior, we will be delivered into the arms of our Creator, Father, And though babies always cry, the Bible tells us that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And in that day, we'll know it was worth it all. How do I find comfort in times of struggle? It helps to understand theologically why bad things happen. Theologically why there's injustice in this world for a while. But it helps even more to understand the mystery of it all, that what God is up to in us what God is up to for eternity and one day will understand. But the greatest comfort I have is is that I can know God because of Jesus Christ. When I have gone through the most difficult times, I don't run to theology. I run to Christ who is God in the flesh who lived known as the Prince of Peace, but also acquainted with suffering, who died on a cross to suffer with us, but who rose from the dead to teach us suffering doesn't get the last word. Glory does. God's power does. Our victory does. And so whatever you're going through right now, I'll be honest with you, I don't know how people go through it without Jesus. But the ultimate answer is not theological. It is to know the answer er. Read through the book of Job. That's what God does for Job. Job, God doesn't answer Job's questions. If he did, Job probably couldn't understand them any more than an infant can understand why am I getting a shot. But God shows up for Job and Job says, before I went through this, I'd heard of you, but now my eyes see you. Now I know who you are. And that's my prayer for you, that you'll know who God is because of Jesus Christ today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help each of us take a next step in you. We thank you for Christ and for his love for us. We thank you that you you do give us intellectual answers. Um, You satisfy the mind, but that you satisfy the soul with your presence as well and your hope. I pray for those who need to take a next step with you right now to become followers of Jesus for the first time, that they would, where they are, surrender to Christ. Jesus, be my leader. Jesus, be my savior. I pray for all of us to take whatever next step you would have for us this week because we live in a world that is suffering alone. We live in a world filled with people who are discovering that their false beliefs don't satisfy their false beliefs are not working when everything is out of control it is we only find strength when we have our feet on the solid rock of jesus christ so that is my prayer for each of us today lord help us to share jesus with others through christ i pray these things amen hey so if something jumped out at you in that message or kind of struck you and you have some more questions or you'd like to take a next step, we want to encourage you to do that today. Um, Over to your right, you can talk with the chat host, talk about next steps, or you can also email Tom Pounder, uh, our online campus pastor. Um, As we kind of end the service today, we're going to come into a time of communion. And if you're prepared to take with us, I want to invite you to take the, the bread and take a little thing of juice or whatever it is that you have handy. I want you just to sit for just a minute and consider Jesus that Jesus went to the cross for you, that his body was broken for you, that his blood was shed for you. And in this moment of communion, while you may be wrestling with next steps, communion is a great place to take a step of surrender, a step of obedience 
And so as you focus on Jesus and all that he has done for you, this may be a great opportunity for you now to say, it's my turn to take a step, a step of obedience, a step of surrender. And so as you take the bread, as you take the juice, I want to encourage you to focus on Christ, but also to look forward to the next step he may have for you. Let's go ahead and share together in communion. All right, if you haven't participated in communion yet, now is your time to do that. And right now I'm gonna to transition to a time of tithes and offerings. This is your opportunity to give back to God what he's blessed us with in so many different ways. And the cool thing is that you can give on so many different platforms. You can go to newlife.church slash give, you can text to give, or click the blue give button above the chat box. Again, if this is your first time at New Life, feel no compulsion to give. We just are so grateful that you've joined us today and hope that you come back next week. But if you do consider New Life your home or you have been blessed in a big way today, we strongly encourage you to, to donate and give your tithes and offerings today. Now I'm going to wrap up with just some quick next steps that you can take. If you have a prayer request today, again, click the live prayer button below the chat box, and we'd love to be praying for you today. Again, there's lots of uncertain times ahead, and we could all use a little prayer, so fill out the prayer request on the live prayer button below. And also, I want you to encourage you to think about what is your next step of faith? What would that be? Is it joining an online life group? If so, again, click the notes section and join one of the online life groups we have available. But if you'd like to bounce off some ideas with me, I would love to talk to you about that. All you have to do is just click Tom P at newlife.church, send me a quick little email, and I would love to talk to you more about next steps you can take in your faith journey. All right, again, I want to once again thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next week with a whole new church online. Have a great week, everyone.